He is the director of that project, and I think has been for, for quite a while. Two years. Um, he has given talks at a bunch of local historical societies over the years, often on similar topics and the role of Quakers and anti-slavery activism. So we're very fortunate to have him with us today. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Robert. Thank you very much. Uh, it is great to be here uh, to talk about uh, this topic, anti-slavery, slavery, and tonight specifically the role of Quakers uh, in Eastern Dutchess County. It is especially great to be here, and thank you to Robert and the Millbrook Historical Society because this is the first live presentation and actually the first meeting of any kind I have attended live since February of 2020. So uh, it's great to be able to speak without having this screen in front of you and half of the people's faces are blacked out because they don't want anybody to see that they're eating their roast beef while they're attending a meeting. Uh, so uh, the Mid-Hudson Anti-Slavery History Project has been around since about 2006 and I'm also very happy to see David Greenwood here and Nan, his wife. David and I worked together for a few years on the project uh, and uh, it was a great program that we put together. Uh, we published a guidebook to slavery, anti-slavery in the Underground Railroad uh, in Dutchess County, and we also have published uh, a, a selection of 36 anti-slavery songs. And if you want, we can talk more about that uh, after, after tonight's presentation. So, my interest in this topic, especially, is due to the fact that I grew up in Dutchess <coughs> County. I was born in Poughkeepsie, I went to all of my schooling and college here before uh, moving away, but the history project and other things kept uh, bringing me back here. So tonight, whoops. Where did we go? Sends a mind of its own. It does. Ah, I just have to touch it. Great, thank you. Yep. Uh, so tonight, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about slavery a little bit, about the role, uh, the complicated role of Quakers uh, in relation to slavery, uh, and the issue somewhat of self-emancipation. How many of you here tonight know something about the history of Quakers in this region? Good. Something about the history of enslavement here? Some as well. Okay, that's great. So we're going to fill in some of those pieces tonight and uh, address several aspects, as I said. It's impossible to cover the entire topic, uh, but we're going to do uh, some of what we can. Take a look at how some local people became national leaders. The local contours of enslavement here in Eastern Dutchess County. The important impact that the Quakers at Nine Partners and at Pauling on Quaker Hill had on not just local Quaker movement, not just on New York State, but on the national anti-slavery movement. Self-emancipation. That comes into a, a short uh, piece we're going to do at the end on Quakers in the Underground Railroad. And the outsized role that Quakers from or affiliated with this area had on the national movement, especially Lucretia Mott, David Irish, and Aaron Powell. There's plenty of Quakers whose names we don't know. In fact, some of you here may know a lot more of the Quakers' names uh, than I do. Uh, and enslaved people, of course, we almost we know almost nothing about them and how they fit in here. We do have some names, Tom and Primus, etc. Just the first names. All were freedom seekers coming to this area. All were affected by, and often aided by, Quakers. I struggle to find great images of Quakers. So of course. 
The one on the right <laughs> is uh, kind of well known, but not necessarily representative uh, of those uh, uh, <laughs> of those uh, uh, of the Quakers themselves. So stereotypes and actuality. We have some stereotypes here. So what was the reality for Quakers? They were certainly religious, they were diligent, they were successful in business, an important point that will come again in later, opposed to violence and war. Often they were known as a friend to the slave, even opposed to slavery. However, to say that Quakers were opposed to slavery is a bit more of a stereotype than a useful historical fact. It tells us only one piece of what is a more complicated story. Quakers, in fact, had a very long history with slavery and the buying and selling of enslaved people. From England to the West Indies uh, to North America, Quakers were intimately tied to slavery and the slave trade and the business around slave-made products early on and for more than a century. Quakers actually advocated for slavery. In the beginning, there was little or no talk of manumission. But by the third quarter of the 1600s, there began to be some rumblings within the Quaker community, specifically in Pennsylvania, around the Philadelphia area, questioning whether it was appropriate for friends to hold slaves. <clears throat> so this put a little bit of fear, these faint voices put a little bit of fear into George Fox and a number of the other Quaker leaders. They had to weave a path between these gentle anti-slavery and inquiries and the harsh reality of Quaker life. So he and others developed something that they called benevolent slaveholding. Be sober and fear God, he said, and love your masters and mistresses, and be faithful and diligent in your master's service and business. So Fox was imploring slave owners to treat their enslaved men and women nicely, and in return was asking slaves basically to grin and bear it. <clears throat> so some voices were raised at this time, as I mentioned, <coughs> questioning uh, slavery from the North American meetings uh, generally was pretty well muted. Toward the end of the 1600s, things began to pick up. Local meetings in Germantown, again right around Philly, were asking how could slavery be acceptable, basing their argument on the biblical golden rule, do unto others, etc. In 1711, a somewhat stronger recommendation came from the Pennsylvania Quarterly Meeting, which proposed that slavery should be, quote, discouraged. Still, most of the questioning by local meetings remained fairly muted until 1767 down at the Oblong in Dutchess County. The Quakers of Eastern Dutchess County, especially those at Oblong and Nine Partners, played an important role, as I mentioned at the beginning, in the first phase of anti-slavery history. So how did they get to that point? The Quaker influence in Dutchess spanned about a century, uh, from somewhere around 1720s up to about 1828 and the Hicksite split. Uh, <clears throat> after spending decades on Long Island, in the early 1700s, friends began migrating to Rye and Purchase in Westchester County. And during those early years down there, they established themselves, uh, and many of them owned slaves as well. In 1728, the first Quaker on the Oblong, Nathan Birdsall, settled at Quaker Hill. 
Uh, that's the thin stretch of land I assume most of you know uh, bordering uh, the state of Connecticut uh, from the southern part of Dutchess all the way up uh, to the top part in Columbia County. After Birdsall came a, a quick succession of Quakers beginning to settle at Quaker Hill uh, and in the 1730s they applied to purchase and they established their own meeting. The, uh, the, bil uh, the building of a meeting house uh, was approved in 1742. This is the new house built in 1764. If you haven't been to Quaker Hill to see the house, you should definitely go see it. Around the same time as the Avalong, a settlement a little further north, right around here at Nine Partners, uh, came into being. At first, the Oblong and Nine Partners were linked as one meeting. Uh, they were alternating their monthly meetings between up here around Millbrook and then down at uh, Pauling on Quaker Hill. And in 1767, Nine Partners was granted its own meeting starting out with a log meeting house, and then eventually uh, the building that came right before uh, the current the, the building here that still stands. Uh, the brick meeting house uh, dates from about 1780, and next to it is a drawing showing the famous Nine Partner School, uh, which is going to come up again a couple of times a night. Quickly after this, there were meetings established at Moore's Mills uh, along Route 82, and the last of them in this early phase was the Creek Meeting uh, over at Clinton Corners. By this point, about 70% of the Quakers living here came from Massachusetts or Rhode Island, <coughs> and this population comprised the largest group of Quakers in North America outside of Philadelphia. Uh, in 1828, according to uh, Dale Lupton, there were about 2,000 in the entire county, most of them concentrated up in this area. By the 1750s, settlers at Oblong and Nine Partners had growing doubts about the rightfulness of slavery. They were influenced by uh, <coughs> John Woolman, who was an itinerant preacher for the Quakers and who conducted an extended ministry up here in this area. His famous 1747 essay, Some Considerations on the Keeping of Negroes, was widely distributed among the Quakers. He tried to live his anti-slavery position in every way. For instance, he spoke privately with Quaker slave owners and succeeded in convincing a number of them to manumit their slaves. And he refused to draw up wills that bequeathed ownership of slaves to an heir. In 1767, it's an important date in history for this area, the Oblong took a rather momentous step in officially questioning the prevailing thought on slavery. And in the process, he riled up the waters of Quaker custom. The monthly meetings sent a question, known as a query, to the Purchase Quarterly Meeting, asking it to reply to their concerns about slavery. They titled it Inconsistency of Slave Keeping with Our Religious Principles. And you can read these here, uh, if you can't, in the back. Isn't slavery a harm to both slave and owner? Doesn't slavery deny the slave freedom to obey his or her inner life? The album questioned the buying and selling of slaves and owning. Should Quakers free their existing slaves? How can we be diligent Quakers and maintain slavery? With this step, Oblong put themselves near the forefront of anti-slavery efforts, not just within Dutchess County, not just within the Society of Friends, but within the American colonies 
totally. This query was a full-blown questioning of the accepted Quaker way of life vis-a-vis -vis slaves. And their questions exposed, as they say, the inconsistencies of slave keeping with this position. Because of the influence of Quakers, both as slave owners and as a force in religious society, their questioning of the legitimacy of slavery spread to others. If slavery was a harm to the slave, they asked, and it certainly was, and people knew that conditions for many slaves were horrible, especially in the Sugar Islands, must not it also be a harm to the owner? That is, a harm to his or her spiritual life. Quakers believed that action was individually driven, or should be individually driven, by one's own inner life. But how, how could slaves follow an inner light that told them their enslavement was wrong? It was accepted in many quarters that holding a slave was okay, but the buying and selling of them was of a different degree. Why should this be not long past? For an answer to what are we going to do with our current slaves? And given all of the above, how can we be diligent Quakers if we hold slaves? How can we be true to our principles? A big ask. Purchase dismissed it. It was too much for them to handle. In fact, they sent a snooty reply. They reprimanded the oblong for basically being out of line. <coughs> the tendency of this query purchase reply is really to stir up trouble. You're causing trouble. So they punted, as they say, and they sent it to the New York meeting to consider. Now, the New York annual, New York yearly meeting Quakers had been addressing the issue of slavery within its community and with questions coming from other areas. But this, from the Oblong, was the most direct and probably the most powerful question that came forward. So it wasn't uh, <coughs> uh, Purchase said, in, in essence, if we did this, it would turn out slaves at large indiscriminately, resulting in great inconvenience. So what is perhaps, however, more interesting, perhaps, and of greater local interest here going forward, is that neither the Oblong nor Nine Partners was waiting for a reply, and in fact, they had been aggressively pursuing the end of slavery in their own meeting areas. Let me just stop for a second. Uh, when the Nine Partners was first established, it was actually affiliated with Quaker Hill. And it wasn't until uh, a couple of decades later that uh, Nine Partners received its own meeting uh, from purchase. So, as early as 1759, Nine Partners was bringing complaints against its members, including a Jonathan Latham and a Daniel Tobias, each for buying a slave. Tobias complied and got rid of his, Latham did not respond, and was disowned by the meeting. In 1762, Nine partners brought charges against three men for buying slaves, with additional charges against one of them for being familiar in a carnal manner with his female slave. All three were disowned. Now, the oblong query and the nine partners action represented still a rather advanced position within the entirety of North American Quakerism on the question of slavery. But 
the anti-slavery effort in Eastern Duchess proved to be slow going. A lot of owners chafed at this, some because of lack of compensation for their lost properties, others because they disagreed with the policy. Those slaves were actually declared free in 1775 and 1776 at Nine Parkers and Pauling. That meant only that slavery would eventually be eliminated. Enslaved women would be totally free at age 18 and males at age 21. Now, this is a little sleight of hand if you're familiar with New York State emancipation history. It follows true to form. In 1799, New York State said, we're going to free all the slaves, but not until this and that and the other thing. So around 1817, the legislature had another meeting and they said, okay, all slaves will now be free in 1827, July the 4th. Well, not quite. Because they again said that the children of freed slaves would owe indenture, carrying on years after 1827, as far as officially 1848 was the freeing of the last indentured child of a slave that was free under New York State law. So what the Quakers did here was similar to what was happening in other parts of the United States. Freedom was being declared but then they're going to change the service of the black men and women to an indenture status. So. Just a quick look at the enslaved population here around this time. So across the top we have 10 year periods. On the left we have uh, six towns in the northeastern side of the county and then the three at the bottom, Fishkill, Poughkeepsie and Rhinebeck were known as the river towns. The river towns were associated with trade on the river as well as really, really rich farmland. So they had a considerably larger number of enslaved people. Now, uh, what's, <clears throat> what's going to happen here is that for the most part, these numbers are going to begin to drop precipitously because slave owners heard about the New York State abolition law in 1797, 1799. So they did not want to get stuck with having to give away property that they paid money for. So there, was a, there were a number of manumission efforts by slaveholders here during this period. And a number of them also broke the law. Because part of the emancipation law said you can't sell your enslaved property to anyone else. But a lot of them did. Uh, but that's a, that's a whole different story. Uh, so, numbers, as I said, out here uh, were considerably lower. There's no real reliable data for towns prior to 1790. Uh, and <clears throat> from the local records, we do have uh, a few names of people. There was Tim, who was owned by the Dennis family in Clinton. Rose, owned by the Ross family in Pauling, uh, James, owned by the Van Wicks in Amenia, uh, Joseph, owned by Leonard Herrick in Washington, uh, etc., etc. So, 18th century Quakers in Dutchess County. They led the way for a period of time in questioning slavery within the context of Quaker principles. They showed some strong leadership on this issue and it had a national impact which we're going to see in a couple of minutes. They didn't wait for the higher ups to act. New York meeting didn't really act until a couple of years after the query. Uh, and 
they followed this up in the 1800s uh, with some more aggressive action, uh, as we'll see in a minute. <clears throat> now, I mentioned a couple times they played a prominent role in national anti-slavery efforts. If we think about anti-slavery, we should look at it in two phases, <laughs> at least two phases. Something was called first phase abolition. And that began around the period of the revolution, 1760s, 1770s, and it went up to the early 1800s. It was driven by religion, morality, and also the principles, the clarion principles of freedom and equal rights contained in the Declaration of Independence. So we can think about uh, this period, and, and we will distinguish right now between this period and second phase abolition, which was predominantly, although not wholly, driven by abolition, which is a different ball of wax from anti-slavery. So they were fighting this on humane, on moral grounds, etc. Quakers in Pennsylvania and New York were influential in helping advance the cause of emancipation, along with politicians and other men and women. People such as Benjamin Franklin, who became influenced by Elias Hicks and his preachings. John Jay, even though Jay owned slaves, he was instrumental in the formation of the New York Anti-Slavery Society and a number of others during this first phase. Working against this first phase abolition and not recognized easily at the time were changes in technology. One of them was the cotton gin. Probably one of the things that we all learned about in school. We're roughly, I'm roughly the same age as many of you here. The cotton gin, Eli Whitney. Sometimes over, over referenced, etc. The second invention was Samuel Slater and the textile mills that were running. What this caused was a huge, huge growth of demand for cotton. At the same time, coupled with the growing worldwide demand for sugar coming out of the uh, Spice Islands in the West Indies. So we have an anti-slavery movement. We have new industrial revolutions happening here all surrounded by a worldwide demand for sugar. Those sugar plantations in the Indies were all run by enslaved people coming right over from Africa. The normal lifespan for an adult slave on the sugar plantations was seven to eight years of useful work. Move them out of the way, bring in the new bunch. What were Quakers supposed to do about these new developments? By the early 1800s, slavery had become an international issue, international issue, far beyond the can of local Quaker meetings. But at the same time, the politics of anti-slavery were morphing into a more radical and a more publicly political realm. It's just one example. Another Duchess County native, James Talmadge Jr. You remember him from your history books? Some of you do. Grew up in Stanford, not far from here. He exploded the slavery issue in 1819 by having the gall to introduce an amendment to the Missouri Bill for Statehood the famous Missouri Compromise. Thomas Jefferson's, oh, it's like a fire bell in the night. Well, that helped to bring the question of slavery 
into the national uh, legislature and it reflected the growing antagonism between slaveholding and anti-slavery forces. What were Quakers to do? Slavery goods, new radicalization, personal behavior or joint action. Quakers were enjoined from joining other organizations. They were expected to follow their own individual path and not to align themselves with other groups for fear that they would be influenced by those groups, therefore abandoning their own inner principles. That's a tough nut to follow. And it became even tougher in the 1800s as the slavery issue hooked up. So how does one balance a personal anti-slavery position with profit making from goods produced by slaves? This is an age-old question. It doesn't have to do with slavery or whatever. How far do your principles go when they come up against your livelihood? You don't need to raise your hand and answer that. But I'll bet everybody here has thought about that once in a while. Oh man, should I throw this out or should I recycle it? I like recycling, but it's really too much work. Quakers, therefore, as well as others, they were faced with how to confront the growing antagonism of a more radical phase of abolition and the continually growing impact of slavery on the American economy. What does it mean to be anti-slavery in this context? Three famous Quakers, all affiliated with Eastern Duchess, face this dilemma head on. And they chose to follow a public more radical response to the slavery question. For them, their inner light drove them to the public sphere, where they found ways to respond to the dilemma of worldly action. Lucretia Mott, probably most everybody here has heard of her. David Irish, if you follow Quaker history or you're familiar with uh, the oblong, you'll know that David was a, uh, a really firebrand anti-slavery uh, advocate uh, down at Quaker Hill. And uh, <clears throat> uh, Aaron Powell, probably the lesser known of the three. Uh, but we're going to take a look at all of those right now. They all became leaders during this second phase of anti-slavery. They all operated in the middle decades of the 1800s as opposed to uh, the 1700s where the first phase played out. They took a more radical stance and they provided a window for us to see some of what was happening. Two of them, Mott, uh, I'm sorry, uh, <coughs> two of them, uh, Irish and Powell, were Dutchess County natives all three had some of their schooling here. Uh, all were radicalized by their early experiences, and they were affected by the teachings of John Woolman and Elias Hicks. <clears throat> and each of them was tied into the issues uh, that were foremost on the minds of Quakers and other Americans at this time, i.e. how to participate in anti-slavery that had grown more radical. Each of these three found answers to the Quaker dilemma in one or more spheres. A more radical abolition, as I said, something called the free produce movement. Fascinating, we're going to see. And the Underground Railroad. We know the most about Lucretia Mott, so let's start with her. And we can't cover everything, obviously. So Mott was born in 1793 in Nantucket to a devout Quaker family. <laughs> devout for Lucretia meant a strong adherence to what her own inner light told her. 
individuals had the authority. The obligation, she said, to find the correct way for them to live as Quakers, not beholden to anyone else, not another Quaker leader in their meeting, not a national Quaker leader. Her most recent biographer described her as a, quote, heretic, not because she spurned the Quaker faith, but because she followed her inner light to wherever it took her, without regard for what others thought. In 1806, at age 13, she boarded here at the Nine Partners School, where she was immersed in a strong anti-slavery curriculum. The school was founded by James Mott Sr., grandfather of Lucretia's future husband, also named James. And we know that one of the things that Lucretia studied is the Middle Passage, where Africans were taken from Africa, put onto these huge slave ships, and brought across the ocean to South America, the islands, and a few of them came up to North America. She studied a picture, a drawing, a famous drawing, of one of the slave boats that held almost 300 Africans in it. And I won't go into all the gory details, but it's something for you to take a look at uh, in terms of how these Africans were packed in, literally, like sardines, under the whole. So, very much influenced by this. Her anti-slavery activity brought her in contact with William Lloyd Garrison, probably the most well-known of the more radical anti-slavery folks, as well as other abolitionists, and with whom she worked from time to time, i.e. against the principles of Quakerism. Put her at odds with Quakers, even though you know, she insisted that this was her right to do in following uh, her life, and it also thrusted her into the public sphere. Now, this is early 1800s. There was a public sphere for men, and there was a domestic sphere for women. And Mary the two should meet, but they often did. Susan B. Anthony, Lucretia Mott, many, many other brave, strong women said, the hell with this, we've got work to do in this man's public sphere, and we're going to do it. That was Lucretia. So, one way that women could engage in the public sphere was through something called the Free Produce Movement. Has anybody heard of the Free Produce Movement? It's really fascinating. It's an attempt it's an attempt, going back a couple of minutes, and it's an attempt for individuals to follow their principles by applying those principles to the marketplace. To the marketplace. Got its start in the 1790s during the first phase uh, anti-slavery movement. John Woolman, who we mentioned earlier, uh, was one of the Quakers who talked about this originally. Its operating principle was simple. Curtail the use of products made through slave labor, such as sugar, cotton cloth, indigo dye, molasses, and similar products that came out of the plantations, sugar islands, etc. The hope was that by a reduction in demand for these products would put slave owners out of business. It's a rather grandiose thought, looking back now from 150 years later, but obviously it was something that drove uh, this issue. Uh, <clears throat> there was a vast expansion, as I mentioned earlier, in the use of slave products during this time. Uh, new tracts of land in 
places like Alabama, Mississippi, Texas, etc., were being cleared for cotton. The free produce movement was strongest in the Midwest, Pennsylvania, and New York. Uh, and though Quakers often took the lead, there were efforts to broaden the movement to other religious and anti-slavery organizations and free black groups uh, for whom the idea of curtailing the use of slave-made products uh, might have held a special appeal. This is a particularly gruesome uh, uh, cartoon, advertisement, etc., related to the free produce movement. So what's happening here is the slave owner is producing something to be sold, some food stuff, and the depiction of the presumably enslaved person being mixed in to the soup, which you and I and everybody else in North America are going to ingest. That was the thinking behind slave-free products. Your cotton cloth, your molasses, contained the blood, sweat, and tears of the slaves who made that. So by eating and using these slave products, you were actually supporting, not opposing slavery. This is this personal, and here's one that's less gruesome, and unfortunately I didn't get, oh, it actually came out better. This was a tag on a uh, a bale of cotton, free labor cotton. So this would have been produced presumably in the southern United States or maybe in some, uh, uh, some middle state area by farmers uh, who were opposed uh, to cotton. <clears throat> so how could you substitute things? So you would use a linen cloth instead of cotton you could take blueberries, blackberries, purple cabbage. I haven't tried this one yet. As a substitute for indigo dye. Maple syrup for sugar, of course, uh, you know, and some other uh, uh, substitutes. So Lucretia and her husband James Mott were early and avid supporters. Uh, perhaps the largest. So between uh, and they had a great deal of influence because of this. Between 1817 and 1862, they supported the building of 53 stores in the East and Midwest. Free blacks also took part in establishing both free labor groups and stores run by and for uh, black people. Now, David Irish. He was born in 1792, an exact contemporary of Mott, uh, another Dutchess County Quaker, as I mentioned. Uh, he was also a major supporter of the free produce movement. And uh, <clears throat> in a memoir, his daughter Phoebe Wanza wrote that his mind is strongly influenced to an active protest against the evils of slavery. And he evidenced that by protest his participation in both the Underground Railroad and in the Free Produce uh, Movement. Every honest man disdains the idea of knowingly purchasing stolen goods of the robber upon the principle that it would be approving and encouraging the act. But, alas, how few hesitate to purchase slave produce of the master merely because he has robbed the slave according to the forms of the law. He and his family continue to use, make their own cotton cloth and refuse to use any slave produced goods uh, up through the uh, emancipation after the Civil War in 1865. Now, <clears throat> it was not a great success. Uh, there simply just wasn't enough of the slave-free products available for people to purchase. Cotton <coughs> was easily available, and as I mentioned, more plantations were being put online. There weren't enough stores, things were more expensive, poorer quality, 
etc., uh, etc. Et and uh, just so you know, if you want an umbrella, a, a slave-free umbrella, you would string some cotton and then you would coat it with some kind of oil. So, not sure how that would have worked out when the rain was coming down. Uh, and lastly, free produce movement was seen as an impediment to the stronger anti-slavery and abolitionist movement coming along that time. So, and the last of our three is Aaron Powell. As I said, he's probably the lesser known here because he spent a uh, very early childhood here, and then around age 14, his family moved a few miles north to Ghent, up in uh, Columbia County. But his father was uh, an anti-slavery person, although he was not a radical. And what his father did was every time there were anti-slavery speakers coming around in Columbia County, he'd invite them to the house. So Aaron caught the bug. Aaron became very, very interested in this story and in this history and in this drive uh, for, for freedom. When he was in his teens, he attended his first anti-slavery conference in Ghent. And that increased his attraction to the extent that he said, I don't want to go to college. I want to work on anti-slavery. So he asked permission of his parents to attend uh, an anti-slavery society meeting way up in Washington County near Lake George. So Powell was looking for a cause. The cause found him. Everybody knows this one. So Powell describes this episode in his memoirs. And I'm starting to cry again already because it's so powerfully moving. So after the meeting, he was talking inside the church with a group of convention attendees. And he says that Sojourner Truth, quote, who had been standing alone by the pulpit, came slowly down the aisle to us about midway in the church and reaching out her long bony arm, placed her big black hand on my head saying, as she did so with prophetic tone and her peculiar low Dutch dialect, quote, I've been a-looking in your face, and I see you in the future pleading our cause. Oh my God, what are you going to do when Sojourner Truth comes and baptizes you like that? <laughs> well, he did exactly what was expected. He jumped headlong into the anti-slavery movement, became a leader, was a strong supporter of the free produce movement. He eventually became editor of the National Anti-Slavery Standard, one of the leading uh, papers uh, during this area. And after the Civil War, he was an advocate for the equal treatment of black Americans and strongly opposed to races one of the few abolitionists who stayed on after the war fighting the cause. I, I'm, I'm, do I have a couple more minutes? I know I'm running long here. So let's talk a little bit about the Underground Railroad in Eastern Dutchess County. So unfortunately, the reality of the Underground Railroad has been overtaken by the mythology of the Underground Railroad. There's been a romanticization, a misplaced emphasis on the role of white people, and mostly, though, a lack of really hard data on which we can hang our hats. But there are some really strong stories uh, uh, relating to the Underground Railroad right here again in Eastern Dutchess County had what has become known as the Quaker Trail to Freedom. Actually, we are a part of the Quaker Trail to Freedom, which started in New York City, came up to Westchester County, uh, Harrison in that area known as the Hills, Purchase, and then from Purchase, coming up the eastern side, probably old Route 22 in that area to mm -hmm. avoid the hills, but then again, and they would go to the Oblong 
and they might run into David Irish. And David Irish would take uh, freedom seekers and keep them at his house, feed them until it was safe to move on. Come up to nine partners or out the Oswego's friends area uh, and then move on to uh, Columbia County. Uh, specifically people like Charles Marriott, and then they would go all the way up as far as Vermont. It was said that a Quaker could leave New York City and sleep in a Quaker home every night, a different Quaker home to get to their journey, which meant that freedom seekers, runaway uh, slaves, could also do that. On the other side of the county, there was what we would call the River Trail to Freedom. Uh, mostly that involved uh, freedom seekers coming up by boat from New York City on their way to Albany. Now, the vast, vast majority of freedom seekers that came into Dutchess County did not come from South Carolina, they didn't come from Georgia, they didn't come from Maryland. They came from Dutchess County, Westchester County, Putnam County. There's a fabulous, fabulous book if you want to learn more about runaway slaves. It's called In Defiance. And the editors are Susan Stesson Cohn and Ashley Biagini. Came out about four or five years ago. They are doing a revised version. The first version identifies 607 runaway slaves from the Mid-Hudson uh, counties, including about 150 right here within Dutchess County. So when we think Underground Railroad and runaway slaves, think right here where you live. The revised version, Susan told me a few weeks ago, they have close to 400 additional names of runaway slaves from the Hudson Valley. So, Underground Railroad, great. Runaway slaves, help them. They weren't coming out. Some were undoubtedly coming from the South if they made it this far. Most freedom seekers from the Southern states actually went west up through Kentucky and then into Illinois and Michigan and made the trip to Canada by crossing over from Michigan. So there's a lot here. Uh, and as Frederick Douglass, who tried twice, I prayed for 20 years to be free, but received no answer until I prayed with my legs. Uh, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great quote. <coughs> Now, the nine partners, we just have two left, I think. This is great. Here's one of the runaway slave ads. And this is from a woman named Anne in Wappingers. Ran away in 1802, a mulatto girl named Mary. The reason I'm advertising her now is that I heard of her being at the nine partners. So. I wonder to myself, did she not advertise two years ago <laughs> when Mary first ran away? Whoever will take up said girl and commit her to the New York jail or restore her to the owner, etc., receive. All persons are hereby strictly forbade. This is a vintage example of a runaway slave ad. Almost every one that you read will follow this format. Uh, now, for historians, is this proof? It's proof that there was a runaway named Mary, but is it proof that she was kept here at Nine Partners? Not quite. That's one of the damnable things. We don't have exactly the full fact here, uh, etc. But uh, it's certainly, it's certainly good enough. Now, just lastly, some of you may be thinking about your own house or a building that you know. Uh, was my house on the Underground Railroad? Judith Wellman is the national recognized uh, leader in researching and attesting to locations where Underground Railroad activity uh, took place. 
So you have to take a look at first if it's your house or a building, when was it built? If it was built after 1863, it's not part of the underground railroad. Research the prior ownership. If part of that ownership include African Americans, that would be important especially. Forget about hidden spaces, tunnels, storage areas, etc. They were all over the place. And people used these hidden places for all kinds of things. So hidden spaces are not proof. Uh, it takes a lot more than that. Now, I'm going to stop here, but I do want to alert you to a really exciting and important uh, new development. 2027 will be the bicentennial of emancipation in New York State. A number of organizations and individuals, including my group, uh, <clears throat> celebrating the African spirit in Poughkeepsie, the Putnam County Historical uh, Association, and a number of individuals have begun to meet to begin planning, programming, and educational efforts. Uh, about the bicentennial of uh, emancipation in New York. And um, if you want more information, contact me if you're interested in getting involved in some way. Uh, also, let me know. Uh, there'll be more information in the History Project newsletters that go out periodically, etc. I have over talk by time. I apologize, Robert. Thank you all so much, and I'll try to answer your questions if we have time for any. We have time for questions. Anyone want to jump in and ask a question? Yes. Um, very important, Jeff. But you definitely don't address the role of women or the role of women around how to play in the early days. Uh, address the role of women or the, or the role they were out to play in the, in the early days of. Uh, it, oh, in like in the 1700s? Yeah. Uh, more than likely, pretty much uh, restricted to the homes. When I say restricted, it doesn't mean they couldn't go out of the house. But generally, interactions in business, uh, leading religious meetings, other types of encounters with the public, those were generally held for men. And that was true outside of the Quaker uh, uh, religion. It was true pretty much uh, during this entire period. I mean, all the men at the, uh, who wrote the, oh, I just gave it away. All the people who wrote the Declaration of Independence Everybody at the Philadelphia Convention in 1783, 84, 85, to all men, etc. Uh, it was rare to have a woman leading a religious meeting, but occasionally that happened. Uh, by the time you get to the uh, early 1800s, you're beginning to see some more of that open up. Uh, uh, and women involved, but it was very, very, uh, very tough. And one more note about Lucretia Mott, even though she was an ardent supporter of emancipation, she was equally ardent in opposing the 15th Amendment, which gave voting rights to black men, not black women. 